From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deckard. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. It is almost the end of the week as you are hearing this evening's program, which means it's one of our favorite times of the week. Folks, we get to share messages from you with our fellow listeners. We're going to learn a little bit about potassium. We got a lot of reactions to that. We're going to learn a little bit about polio based on our uh, our recent episode about the tainted polio incident. Uh, We are also going to have some letters from home, uh, and we're going to talk about the Winchester Dam. I think we we decided off air, guys, that uh, we got so many uh, emails, so many messages about potassium that we had to start there, right? Ah, uh, yes, potassium, the humble K on the periodic table. Uh, and this message comes to us courtesy of the humble poodle crab, which is a delightful nickname uh, that apparently we can call them. Hi, you can call me poodle crab. I have thought about writing in about potassium for the past few months, but after, wow, already, but after your most recent listener mail episode where the other listener talked about it, I finally got around to writing in. About six months or so ago, my doctor let me know he was worried about my blood pressure. I was adamant about not going on meds for high blood pressure if I could help it. I started looking into alternatives and realized the relationship between potassium, magnesium, and salt. As Noel stated, there are some people who need a low-potassium diet, and usually that is due to kidney disease. I started eating a high-potassium diet, but because potassium is weakened by heat and most foods uh, that have it, we eat cooked. See, here we go. Um, I found it hard to get enough in my diet, so I added potassium supplements as well. I do take more than one pill per day uh, recommended. After several months of taking my potassium and magnesium supplements three times a day, I finally had a good visit with my doctor, and he's happy with my blood pressure numbers. I am not a healthcare professional, but I definitely think that the amount of people who uh, it would be adverse to take a higher supplement amount of potassium should be rather low compared to the majority who really need a larger amount. Uh, They should sell a higher milligram supplement. My personal opinion is that if we're all Uh, low in potassium, we acquire more health issues, and big pharma can make more money off of drugs. I also have another conspiracy you could look into that is related. There is a gentleman named Frank Suarez who is Puerto Rican. He wrote several books on metabolism that are available in English and Spanish. He also has a YouTube channel called Metabolism uh, Metabolismo TV, it appears. Um, I think most of his videos are in Spanish, but I'm pretty sure they have English subtitles available. He has several where using nutrition and supplements, he was able to make people better so they no longer needed medications. Anyway, my conspiracy concerning him is that he died a few years back. I believe, if I remember correctly, he fell off a balcony at his home. Could Big Pharma have had him killed because he was helping people get off meds? Thanks for reading my ramblings. Feel free to use this on air if you want. I've been listening watching from the very beginning. Love you guys. Handful of things to unpack here. Um, first of all, I think it's interesting to note, uh, and I believe we discussed this, the, the bioavailability of metabolism and also the, the way things are absorbed and, um, you know, the idea that cooking something, you know, could potentially completely uh, remove the potassium that, that, uh, that gets absorbed into your system. Um, and uh, it seems that poodle crab, uh, confirmed by their doctor, was able to affect some change to, you know, their their blood pressure numbers by this and this alone. Um, and I always think it's interesting when someone decides to go that route, a more holistic approach, and then actually sees results. So I don't know, guys, does that track for you that this could be done? Yes. Again, the um, one of the larger themes we have seen in uh, our correspondence recently concerns the very real fact that there's not a silver bullet solution. 
right? Every person is unique in this regard. We are not medical professionals. But one thing that really stands out to me here, Poodle, is if I may call you Poodle, uh, <laughs> Poodle Crab, one thing that stands out to me is your mention of Frank Suarez. Uh, Frank Suarez does have a, a website and, as you mentioned, does have uh, various works out there in the wild in 1998 he founded something called natural slim and i'm wondering whether this has a place in our upcoming episode on supplements yeah metabolismo tv has 8.76 million subscribers Mm -hmm. that's a lot of people who are paying attention to what he's saying yeah and suarez struggled with obesity per his uh, like official bio. He struggled with obesity since childhood, tried numerous different diets, and they weren't working. So he researched the causes of what is sometimes called slow metabolism, and it led him to this concept of metabolic function. Uh, His book, uh, 2006, I think, El Poder del Metabolismo, is a huge book. For the folks who follow his insights, uh, it has been a lifesaver, in their opinion. Not yeah. the candy, but like save their lives. It's, it's one of those things you just got to be careful because there's like, I haven't watched any of the videos yet. We, you know, obviously it, it's going to require some research, but when there are claims like all you have to do is get your vitamins right and mm-hmm. you can beat cancer, mm-hmm. it's just it's just potentially dangerous, right? It's tough. Well, that's what I was asking. Yeah. It's up there with... Uh, are you having financial problems? Have you tried not being poor? You know That's what I fair. mean? Like it's it's missing some steps often. That kind of advice. We're not talking about Suarez in general. We need to do more research poodle crab. But I, again, to your point, Noel, we had so much, uh, we, we got so much incredible correspondence based on the original letter from our pal Iron Man. Yeah, and we're not also, uh, I believe, any of us trying to say that that we don't believe that it is possible to affect change in your health through just diet and and uh, and the right vitamins and and um, you know minerals, et cetera. Um, and it, it would appear from Poodle Crab's experience personally, firsthand, that that is exactly what happened with them. Um, the case of Suarez is very interesting because not a lot is known about him outside of his own channels and what he put out there on the internet. Um, the book, I believe, achieved roughly 5 million sales, and yet nobody knows what his birthday was. Um, and a lot of details about his background are a bit uh, shadowy. I don't mean shadowy in terms of that it's like sinister. I just mean, you know, unknown. Um so that is very interesting for a for a best selling author of that uh, degree, and not a lot of details are out there as well about the investigation behind his death. At least upon you know kind of a cursory um, uh, search, but I do think this is definitely appropriate to include in the episode coming up on supplements. No question. Also, Suarez may have a space in our continuing series on the mysterious deaths of inventors and scientists, which again unfortunately, will be a continuing series. Absolutely. And since we did mention that we got quite a few emails about uh, supplements and potassium, I thought we might read another one that's sort of a counter to Poodle Crab's message. This one coming from Pepper Ann. Uh, Hello, I've been loving and listening to your show for about a year now. This is my second email, by the way, so this is the test to see if you do read them all. Wink, wink. Well, here we go. Test passed. Uh, It feels a little like a conspiracy, just saying. Oh, okay. Well, it's conspiracy solved. Uh, I previously wrote about haunted airplanes and EMS, but that's neither here nor there. I had to immediately respond to the show before I even finished the entire episode because I generally worry about the health implications of the letter written into you guys uh, regarding the use of potassium. First, I will say I have worked as a nurse and in critical care for about 10 years now. I'm not a doctor, so there is your disclaimer, but I am working on my nursing doctorate. Either way, I know a thing or two about electrolytes. Let me start by saying that your body is designed to conserve and highly regulate your potassium in a very narrow and safe range. This would be the reason that you cannot buy over-the-counter potassium in more than 10 milligrams, because it can and would be fatal without the oversight of a physician. In the hospital, we can only administer potassium at a rate of 10 MEQ per hour safely, 
Otherwise, we run the risk of fatal cardiac arrhythmias. If you have a medical condition that requires supplementation, a doctor will prescribe one for you at a higher dosage, and you will likely require blood work to monitor this. Common reasons would be medications that prevent your kidneys from retaining those potassium levels so tightly. People who tend to have lower potassium levels are likely due to a dietary deficiency, which is the best and safest way for your body to get potassium. This can be found in bananas, leafy greens, beans, avocados, tomatoes, all things you don't have to cook, uh, root vegetables, zucchini, eggplant, etc. I fear it is likely that people are not getting enough fresh fruits and vegetables. Additionally, magnesium and potassium have a type of symbiotic relationship, as our uh, previous uh, emailer um, mentioned. Uh, meaning, uh, if your magnesium is low, there is a good chance that your potassium will be low and magnesium supplements are much safer and easier to get over the counter. Bottom line, if you're concerned about your electrolytes, get them checked out. There are even places that you can go without a doctor's order to have them checked. I would have to say there is probably no conspiracy to prevent people from getting potassium. It is, in fact, this way to prevent people from accidentally putting themselves into a cardiac arrest. There you go. Also, they attached a, an email with a picture of their blind, deaf dog with eyebrows. Hold on, yes, let's check it thank out. thank you for sending, by Holy the way. Holy cow, yeah. yeah. Thank oh. you to everyone who's been sending the uh, the pet photos. I love the eyebrow work there. And uh, I do want to point out, for anybody who hears the phrase blind, deaf dog, let's remember that the primary way uh, canines encounter the world is through the sense of smell. So we know this very lucky pooch is very lucky to have uh, a human like you in their lives. That's right. Absolutely. A um, couple of things here. The eyebrows are amazing, by the way. Uh, I've been wanting to try that. I have a white dog as well, and I, <laughs> I, she's got expressive eyebrows. I really think that's the way to go. Um, I'm drinking a coffee right now, guys, that has 200, at least according to the packaging, 268 milligrams of potassium in it. And nice. I don't know why. I'm looking at the mm -hmm. ingredients list and there's no like, oh, there's potassium in here. Is so, there any flavoring to it? <laughs> there's a small, yeah, it's a, it's a rich mocha black rifle thing. Some energy drink. It's like energy coffee, right? So it's got extra stuff in it. Black rifle is a flavor? No, that's the company that oh, makes okay. it. Okay, that um, makes way more sense. Sounds dangerous. Uh, we're not sponsored by them, by the way. Watch um, out for those cardiac arrhythmias, Matt. Well, I know, like what that it genuinely worries me. It says it's six percent of my, you know, intake of potassium on a daily basis, and I just don't know enough about it. Um, well, I, I I do want to point out that um I, I had to Google something and I was, was a little unclear as to what it meant, so I went with milligrams. But the actual term that uh, Pepper Ann used in the email was MEQ, mm -hmm. which is a medical term. It's an expression of the number of grams of a medication contained in one milliliter of a normal solution. Okay. So 10 milligrams might actually be off, but it seems that that was what they were getting at. Okay. Oh, hey, there was another message. We don't have to read the whole message, but... There's a message from, I believe it's Baron Eaton himself mm. talking about the prime energy drink and hydration drinks mm. that uh, Logan Paul is putting out right now. First of his name. Baron. Yeah, <laughs> Logan of the Pauls and uh, just the, the amount of potassium that's contained in those drinks. Uh, interesting stuff. And again, shout out to shout out to Iron Man. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to mention in our previous uh, listener mail conversation, uh, he had something in the title that was like beans, but not the way that you think. So uh, it sounds like one of the primary things we're hearing from our fellow listeners is that um, eating the right sorts of foods uh, can function as preventative medicine in this case. So it turns out Stickman from Dead Press was right. Let your food be your medicine. Guys, so sorry. Just to set the record straight. 10 MEQs is, is 740 milligrams. Okay. So you're fine, Matt. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Maybe we should even, I don't know. We, we got there. Um, sorry, not a medical professional here. First time I'd seen that term, but I did find a converter. So yes, it is different. MEQs is its own measurement and 740 milligrams is 10 uh, MEQs. Okay. So you're going you're to gonna, gonna be okay, Matt. You're going to be okay. Oh, wait. But uh, according to Baron Eaton... Prime sports drink has 700 milligrams of potassium in it, which is like Get right on, on it. it's right on the line. It does appear to be right on the line. Yes. Get on it. One a day. 
Well, thanks to Poodle Crab and uh, Pepper Ann for those uh, very interesting emails. That you know, s- sort of different perspectives, but they also had some some interesting overlap. Um, so let's take a quick break, hear a word from our sponsor, and then come back with more messages from you. All right, we've returned, and we are going to Oregon for a little story from a concerned citizen. Hey guys, it's me again, calling from Central Oregon, well, Central Southern Oregon. Anyway, let's call me Concerned Citizen today. So there is a dam just north of Roseburg, Oregon, on the North Encore River called the Winchester Dam. I think that's right. It's either Winchester or Winston. It's got to be Winchester. Winston is south. Anyway, so it's pretty much like air and Brockovich levels of bad for the drinking water that we are supplied here in Roseburg, and nobody's doing anything about it. As far as I can tell, this dam was placed illegally. It does not offer power generation. It does not have a fish ladder. It is simply just basically a puddle for rich people on the river to have for their seaboats, and that's it. There is no public access to it whatsoever. It's just a rich neighborhood with a pool that is made out of the river, basically. And I was hoping that you could shine a little bit of light on that for me, because I cannot do digging near as well as you guys. Thank you so much for your time, and Happy New Year. Uh, that was hey. <laughs> hey, happy new year to you. That was sent to us in like early February, guys. So uh, also you can still t- <laughs> happy new year. <laughs> it is. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's new year all year. You know, happy <laughs> Halloween true. as well. I love that one too. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Happy uh, Arbor Day. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Concerned Citizen. Guys, we're traveling to Roseburg. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it there, Concerned Citizen. I would have said Roseburg because that's how it's spelled. Uh, and it, we're talking about the Umpqua River that kind of snakes through this area. And you can look at the it is the Winchester Dam, by the way. And you you can look at a picture of this from up above via the Google Maps. And you can see where the dam exists and where kind of the neighborhood area is. The concerned citizen is referencing there. Did a little searching just to try and figure out what's going on with this dam. The first thing I came across was an AP News article from early October last year, 2023. Uh, I'll just give you the title so you can look it up on your own. Oregon seeks $27 million for dam repair. It says resulted in mass death of Pacific lamprey fish. Mm-hmm. I think, guys, I think we heard about this just in our news explorations that we do every week, but we never really talked. We didn't talk about it. It wasn't a huge thing. It's a fish die off. Those are unfortunately common now. This one had to do with repairs to this Winchester Dam that were being done by a couple of different organizations, uh, the Winchester Water Control District, and then under that Terra Firma Foundation Repair, who are actually that's the company that's actually performing repairs. And I think it's called Dowl D O W L L L C, an organization that was going to work to basically get the lamprey fish out of harm's way when this dam or part of the river had to be drained in order to make repairs to the dam. Mm -hmm. Now, when you hear that in your head, what does that look like? That means the dam itself where the water stops, right? Where the river stops up against that dam. They had to stop water from flowing down the river to a certain extent in order to actually go in and repair the foundation of that dam itself. And at least according to this suit, that you can find, uh, it's I think it's from right around that same time, October 6th, 2023. There is a claim from the state of Oregon via the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the State Fish and Wildlife Commission of $27.585 million against these organizations for not properly getting those Pacific lamprey fish out of harm's way before draining the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, that has nothing to do with water quality concerned citizen. So sorry, (laughs) that that is not what you're calling in about. That's just the first thing we noticed because this, this, uh, dam itself has been looked at with some pretty heavy scrutiny. And in that, in that, uh, article, I'm just going to read the statement because this is how the dam is described by Mm -hmm. Claire Rush, who wrote that article for AP news quote, Built in 1890 on the North Umpqua River, Winchester Dam is a former hydropower plant that is now privately owned by the Water District's residents, so the neighborhood, right, that concerned citizens talking about. 
going back to the quote, who largely use it for water sports and recreation, according to this complaint, again, by the state of Oregon. So they're at least confirming that that's what the dam is, who uses it, and, you know, why it still exists, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then we jump down just to, gosh, like less than 20 days later, there is a piece written in Oregon Public Broadcasting by Alex, I think, Baumhart. That's how you would say that. This is about the very thing Concerned Citizen was talking about. That same water district is facing or was facing fines for water violations. So basically sending unclean water down the river because of whatever is occurring on the other side of that dam where the residents live, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Guys, do you have that article up? Yes. Let's go through it just quickly because I haven't haven't looked at this too deeply. Let's just find out what the heck is actually going on. Is it going back to those same repairs, basically, that they sent chemicals or or silt or something down the river? Right. Yeah. The issue is, if you have ever been around a construction site, they get really messy really quick. That's just the nature of how construction works. And the concerns here, I'm I'm going also, Matt, to uh, some folks at a place called waterwatch.org who have who have made some comments on this. Um, The dam repairs are controversial because locals feel the folks repairing the dam have not followed the established standard operating procedure. And Mm. as such, it didn't just compromise the passage and safety of fish or marine wildlife, but it also compromised the drinking water and waterwatch.org. Fellow conspiracy realist, you can tell by the title, they have a certain perspective. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Waterwatch.org is arguing that the local community provided information on how to conduct these repairs well in advance to preserve the quality of drinking water and the quality of, I don't want to say quality of life, the chance of existence for these fish and that they were roundly, consistently, continually ignored, uh, even though they did everything right in terms of uh, speaking with the appropriate authorities and so on. Dude, uh, well, according to Oregon Public Broadcasting, the two main things or the they're the reason that there is a fine of one hundred and thirty four thousand addition additional dollars for like basically uh, water quality was because the companies performing those repairs, quote, allowed concrete to spill into the river, which is probably not great. And they placed what they're saying are unpermitted mats made of heavy truck tires in the river. And mm. and we've talked about this before, the dangers of that, the specific types of rubber and metal that go together to create a modern tire and how when that stuff breaks down just on streets, right on roads, especially highways, that pollutes the water table as again, you just imagine the particulate matter of tires slowly, very, very slowly wearing down. That's why you got to replace your tires, right? When they go, you go in and check them because you're actually losing rubber on the road that could be potentially really dangerous just sitting in a river's waterways right yeah it reminds me of uh a few years back uh during my car stuff days we looked into this very well-intentioned mission to save coral reefs by setting up used tires as a structure for them to grow on spoiler it did not work well uh and and i feel like also matt at this point we probably want to share with everyone a description of the pacific lamprey this does not look like a trout it does not look like a salmon it looks like the worms from dune it looks like a very kawaii pocket (laughs) version of the worms from dune or the venusian sandworms from beetlejuice these guys are not winning fish beauty contest but no they are an important part of the ecosystem they do deserve to exist just want to give you a warning a heads up folks if you're playing along at home and you heard (laughs) You heard concerned citizen and Matt mention lampreys. Gird yourself. Be ready. Yeah. They don't look like they belong on Earth, but they do. 
<laughs> and they are pretty tiny. It's it's kind of like an eel and a fish together with some kind of face hugger situation. They'll I, get you. They'll get you. Well, they are. Many of them are parasitic. I believe the Pacific lamprey is parasitic. There's yes. there's like one species in Oregon that is not. Uh, they're really interesting. What? Oh, they function the way we know salmon function. Remember, we talked about right. that salmon sucker, whatever the thing was. The, the salmon ladder. They need cannon. a ladder. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, this dam doesn't have anything like that for these lampreys or the salmon that exist on that river that are want to get back up the river to spawn, mm-hmm. uh, but they can't. And that's not good. So that needs to change for sure. Um, Oh, what was the? Oh, good goodness! There was one other thing I wanted to talk about with this with these guys. They are kind of tiny and weird looking, like uh, almost like worms. The way you describe it, Ben, uh, not a sandworm, but just an actual worm. They just look really weird. You can see pictures of a lot of them dying or expired in the riverbed when those repairs were occurring. Terrible. Well, it doesn't seem like something. How do I put this? It doesn't seem like something that most people would be concerned about, right? True. They're also, though, they do have a big part in uh, in Native American ceremonies and folklore. Like they're, they do matter, right? Even yes. even things that you, I don't know if anybody listening this evening is thinking I know the most beautiful fish, or if you have that <laughs> kind of hierarchy in your head, the lamprey may not meet it. But again, they do have they do have a right to exist. And our word for the day. I suppose would be anadromous or anadromous, which is just the marine life forms that are required to migrate to exist. And if you set up, it's kind of like um, the land bridges that have been built over interstates and state roads. If you if you interrupt that passage of life, then you are futzing with the larger ecosystem in a way that humans do not fully understand. There is no political bias in saying that, that is just absolutely true. In the land bridge example, what the humans did was they said, hey, we're a lot of mammals specifically are going to die because they cannot move through their natural range without getting hit by a semi truck or a tractor trailer, uh, you know, or like a hot headed fast and furious Camaro. I don't know. So they built these, uh, they built these natural esque land bridges over the roads and that solved the problem. Uh, it seems that it should be standard operating procedure for human made dams to have something like that for fish, right? Yeah. No, that makes, that makes total sense. I think it's something that should occur. Let's make it happen. Y'all. Uh, slash the, what, what was it called? The Winchester Water Control District? Come on, guys. <laughs> is, that <our laughs> new, is that our new beef for the week? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, we don't know enough about it. We were sent right, the message right. and we're looking into it for the first time. Yeah. Oh, I, can I do a shout out for another podcast really quickly, guys? Not affiliated please, with us please, in any way? Please, please, of course. I am obsessed with and have blown through every episode in existence of a show called We're Here to Help. Ooh, it's ooh. uh it's Gareth Reynolds and Jake Johnson. Um mm. Gareth Reynolds, aka Fit Aaron Paul. If you guys ever hear that, I'm saying that on purpose. Um, and it is it's an advice show, like a call-in advice show that is tremendously entertaining. And hats off it. to those guys for and uh to Kevin, who's uh, the their producer, hats off to them for just making a splendidly entertaining show. And it's not related to the 2007 2007- comedy we're here to help no uh this is just two guys who occasionally have guests on and give advice to random callers but the the cool thing about the show is that like uh, early on you'll hear them give advice to one person right and mm-hmm. then like 10 episodes later that same person calls back in to update on how the thing is going nice. so you get this experience of like just a journey you're taking with everybody who's a part of the show it's uh splendid nice Nice. Uh, we also have to say it's not all bad news in terms of the existence of fish, right? We we know that there are, like I saw something, Matt, um, just about a week ago where also in Oregon, not Central Oregon, Eastern Oregon, they had their first salmon spawn in like three decades. Oh, so, wow. 
Yeah, so news. these these things sound maybe weird and obscure and municipal or maybe tree huggish, but they do matter. It is important to uh, stick up for the wildlife in your neck of the global woods. Yeah, and for the water quality. Oh, yeah, also the humans. Sorry, you know. I always forget to add that part. Yeah, them too. <laughs> well, I mean, everybody's got to use that water, including the lampreys. Come on. <laughs> All right, well, uh, well, that's it for now. Thanks so much, Concerned Citizen. We'll be right back with more messages from you. Hello, everyone. Quick note before we proceed with the last part of this week's listener mail segment. We are going to explore correspondence we received related to our earlier episode on tainted polio vaccinations. Uh, After we recorded this episode, we learned that the heroic Paul Alexander passed away on March 12th. Uh, We're playing the episode as we recorded it before his demise, and our thoughts go out to his family and friends. Thank you so much. We now resume our regular show. And we have returned with some messages from you. Uh, First things first, folks, thank you to everyone who tuned in on our episode about tainted polio. It is a heartbreaking chapter of American history. And as we said earlier in that episode, history itself is always closer than it might look in your textbooks and in your rear view mirror. So we thought we would share uh, some excerpts from many of our fellow conspiracy realists who wrote in with their own experiences regarding polio. We want to go first to our pal Jake, who says, in part, first off, Osama bin Laden. Personally, I'm glad he's gone. I would like to share an inner hot take. Yeah, hot take that's take. a super hot take, bro. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> we were worried about that one ourselves. <laughs> Holding out for all those Osama stands out there. Yeah. Oh, and that on a couple levels, Noel, that was very well done. Yes, sir. Uh, I, uh, oh, I, yeah, Osama stands. Yeah. Sorry, that didn't even I, it was flew right past me. Also, I remember, um, you know, for any pro bin Laden folks in the audience, I'll take the hit. I was the one who said, I think he's a bit of a pill. Uh, also glad he's gone, Jake. I'm team Jake on that. Uh, Jake wanted to share an interview from a, another podcast uh, that he listens to quite a bit. Again, not affiliated with us, but we want to give credit where it's due. Uh, Jake is telling us about the Sean Ryan show. Episode 27 has Rob O'Neill from SEAL Team 6, and the name of the episode is The Man Who Killed Bin Laden. So we haven't done an entire episode yet on the circumstances surrounding the death of OBL. You can hear, I think, at different times in in our past, you can hear us take a couple shots at the official story. Uh, and maybe there's an episode in the future, but Jake says interesting bits and pieces here. You don't really hear about the media or Hollywood. Uh, this, uh, this podcast, Sean Ryan's has interviews with ex military types that would make you think, okay, just another military interview show. Yet it delves into a bunch of topics ranging from psychedelic treatments, UFO and UAP, human trafficking, remote viewing, and more. So if you, um, as Matt said earlier, we don't restrict ourselves to shouting out shows that are on our network or that work with us. Uh, we shout out shows that we think are worth your time. Here's what Jake says about polio. Quote, secondly, polio. Obviously, there is an increasing division between those for vaccines and against vaccines with the COVID vaccine at the forefront. There are people out there, myself included, That are definitely for vaccines, childhood, travel requirements, etc., but are against the COVID vaccines and are being swept into the evil anti-vaxxer category. All that being said, I firmly believe we all have to do our own research and decide what is best for our own health and that of our families. The Cutter pharmaceutical story brought up something I read a few years ago that raised the hair on my back about an oral polio vaccine that was being developed in the late 50s. And here is a returning uh, indirect guest. Jake pointed out 
a book we talked about in the past, The River, A Journey to the Source of HIV by Edward Hooper. Remember this? We talked about this a few years ago. We read the book, too. You read the book. Okay, well, all right. we, <laughs> hey. <laughs> we know about the book. Uh, it It is an interesting read. It's one that I think we want to hear more people respond to because in this in this book, Hooper lays out what you could call a conspiracy theory, and it's made in good faith, and uh, it made enough of a splash that scientists looked back at the theory. As Jake notes, uh, it is considered largely disproven, but the question is, is it disproven for real or is it a cover-up? We want your opinions. Just going to roll that one out to the audience. Uh, but do, do you guys remember hearing this theory about the propagation of AIDS, like a tainted vaccine? Uh, yes. It, it's, a, it's weird because I remember we encountered it. I, talking about vaccines is just weird nowadays. Uh, it, it's just a weird subject of any vaccine in general. Right. And this concept, I felt like we didn't see it proven from the book, but I don't know mm-hmm. that I, I wasn't convinced, but same, same, same. However, we are not medical professionals, as we always say in these conversations. So let us know what you think about this book. Thank you to Jake for writing in here. We have Another thing, and an interesting character evolution from a returning guest. Our guest, who now goes by the conversant coyote. Oh. Huh? Remember? Was the original? Originally, this coyote was stoned. Stoned, that's right. <laughs> now he's hopped up. He's all wired. Okay. He can't so, stop talking. So now he's conversant. And he says, greetings, voices from the void. I'm sure you've gotten a few emails about this, but just in case you didn't, I wanted to pass it on to you. After listening to your episode on polio, I found myself a little shocked you didn't mention Paul Alexander, who contracted polio in 1952 and has needed to use an iron lung ever since. He is now an attorney in Texas, and his story really brings home this disease to the modern day. Here's a link to a story about him, and I hope you all find it as interesting as I did. Uh, And our now conversant coyote has says an excellent piece in The Guardian by Linda Rodriguez McRobbie called The Man in the Iron Lung. And with our conversation about tainted polio vaccines, we'll recall we, we did mention the iron lung. And I think we were we were asking each other, you know, is this is this a quality of life question, right? Do you have to be in an iron lung for the entirety of your existence? That's right. We didn't quite, I think, fully know. Um, And and, and the way it's reported oftentimes does seem like it's you're, you're isolated in that environment, but it does appear from several firsthand accounts that we got via email uh, and other uh, sources that you can just do a couple hours a day or even a week. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a type of what's called a negative pressure ventilator. It's a mechanical respirator. And to your point, Noel, um, I was wondering if it's similar to dialysis treatment, right? Mm. Like you're not always hooked to a dialysis machine if you are undergoing dialysis, but you do have to go in regularly. Uh, it, It looks like the argument is that the use of iron lungs today is largely obsolete because there have been improvements in respiration and breathing therapies. Uh, However, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and I didn't know this, there was a a moment of uh, re-emergent interest in using iron lungs as a cheap substitute for ventilators because so many people needed them. I didn't know that. I didn't know it either, and I'm uh, I'm thankful that we are not currently using iron lungs and ventilators. But please do check out that Guardian story. Uh, we we have one more. We had so much response to the um, to the story about the the polio the cutter incident, right? And here's one last one from Grace, and this is one that I, I think meant a lot to all of us, and hopefully to those of us listening at home too. Hi, Stuff They Don't Want You to Know, writes Grace. I'm a 32-year-old polio survivor, and I'd love to chat more about the polio episode and how important vaccines are to keep polio 
at bay. Uh, Grace has shared with us her own, and I, I, it's totally okay to say her name on air because she has shared with us a, a piece she wrote at voicesforvaccines.org. You can read the, uh, you can find it easily. Just uh, search on your browser of choice, Grace Voices for Vaccines. I'm a polio survivor. I don't want you to get it. And in this, we see, again, that history is much closer than the textbooks make it appear. I'll just give us the very beginning of this and let's discuss. Grace writes, in July of 2022, an unvaccinated 20-year-old in Rockland County, New York, was diagnosed with paralytic polio, a disease that's almost eradicated. Many ask, how did this happen? To polio survivors like me, it was only a matter of when, not if. With misinformation regarding healthcare and vaccines skyrocketing. Uh, and then Grace continues I'm 30 years old. I contracted polio in 1992 in India. Shortly after, I was adopted and raised in St. Louis, Missouri by a phenomenal and supportive family. Despite having great insurance and access to world class medical care, polio is not an easy ride. One in 200 polio infections are paralytic. And mine was one of them. Jeez. It goes on. Um, <laughs> the stats are solid. Grace is an awesome person. Uh, Grace is also bringing up, I think, uh, something that it's easy for us to forget in, in the modern day, which is just because you're not hearing about something in a headline, just because it's not all over social media, that doesn't mean it's gone. These things are out there. They're very real. And um, the reason we bring this up, similar to the potassium debate, we're hearing a lot of very well-written, very well-reasoned, sometimes contradictory correspondence about polio and indeed about the nature of vaccines in general. So I was hoping that we could make space real quick. Uh, do you guys have reactions to this? Like, would you... If you contracted polio or something, would you go to an iron lung if you had to? What would be your decision? Wow. Uh, just geez. the small talk, just the light yeah, questions. Well, well I, 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 I'm, I'm no expert, so I would, I guess I would do my own research as, as we always recommend to doing. And I would pair that with the advice of, of medical professionals and see where I landed. If, if, it, if it seemed like something that would benefit me long term and I didn't, it didn't, like you said, Ben, uh, completely plummet my quality of life, then, yeah, I think I would do it. Well, going back to that Guardian article, The Man in the Iron Lung, uh, this person contracted polio a long time ago. He's now 74 years old as of three years ago, so he has 77 now. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, isn't he an, isn't he an attorney? Yes, in Texas. I'm, so, I mean, uh, cares about that iron lung. Uh, just follow him in Paul's footsteps. You'll be good to go. Paul Ex Alexander. That's amazing. Get the, yeah, get the law on your side. Get your degree. <laughs> well, so, I mean, but yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there are images of him when he was first written about when he was a child and in an mm -hmm. iron lung and of him painting with his mouth, uh, using, you know, holding the paintbrush with his mouth and making incredible art. So I think in the end, it's how, how strong are you mentally, right? Mm. With anything like this. And, and if you're, if you are, if you can find it within yourself to fight and keep moving forward, then it, you know, the physical stuff is going to affect you the way it does. And you just decide how you let that affect you. Right. And what mentally. is your support network too? Oh, huge. Right? huge. That's huge. huge. That is actually a fundamental ingredient in what we call blue zones, Blue zones are the parts of human civilization wherein people have a much higher chance of living past 100. Uh, there's, there are only, I think, two in the U.S. One is in California and one is, weirdly enough, in New Jersey. Yeah. No, no offense to uh, our listeners in New Jersey for me saying weirdly enough. <laughs> but but hey just to go back to grace's story too yes you know she's sharing she's out there sharing her story with places mm -hmm. like uh the shriners hospital and stuff mm -hmm. and she is taking that adversity that she's faced and turning it into something super positive the same way paul did so i don't mm -hmm. know i agree with that yeah and i think that's an excellent point because both uh paul and grace by raising visibility uh have been 
actively saving lives. You can never discount that, right? And let's maybe end our polio conversation for now with a quote directly from you, Grace. And thank you again so much for your advocacy and for sharing your story. Grace writes, misinformation is why a 20-year-old was diagnosed with polio in 2022. Misinformation is why hundreds of thousands unnecessarily died of COVID instead of being vaccinated. Misinformation will continue to disable and kill people as long as it remains unchecked. It's something to think about. And uh, we wanted to say that there is uh, there's much more to discuss regarding polio Uh, regarding the concept of vaccination in general, we look forward to hearing from you, fellow conspiracy realists. We like to do a little bit of uh, letters from home at the end, not necessarily new leads on new shows or topics, uh, but just, you know, some how you doings, some nice to see yous. Uh, We got to give a shout out to our friends at Casual Preppers Podcast and our fantastic social team, Station 16, especially our pal Erica, We started doing some polls on the internets and we were asking questions like, what is it? What's your favorite survival food or what's the best? What do you need to bring into a bunker? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did we put out the one about uh, what's which vehicle slash ride? I think we did. Oh, yeah. In in an apocalypse situation. um, Definitely going Falcor. Yeah. Yeah. Falcor for sure. Yeah. This is the way. Yeah. Falcor's the way, but uh, check out our polls uh, that we're we're doing on Instagram. Again, all praise due to Erica. Check out our pals, Casual Prepper Podcast. Shout out to a need-to-know basis for the quality conspiracy realist music you sent us recently. If you would like to join the show, we would love to hear from you. Join up with Concerned Citizen, Poodle Crab, Grace, Paul Alexander, Jake, and many, many more. We try to be easy to find online. Correct. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff, where we exist all over the internet, including uh, places like Facebook, where we have our Facebook group. Here's where it gets crazy. On YouTube, where you will be able to see some of those videos that Ben was talking about rolling out every single week. And on X, FKA Twitter, on uh, Instagram and TikTok, we are Conspiracy Stuff Show. We have a voicemail system. Use it if you choose. Call 1-833-STDWYTK when you call it. Give yourself a nickname and let us know if we can use your message and voice on the air in one of these listener mail episodes. If you got more to say than can fit in that three minutes, why not instead shoot us a good old fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.